all stand and sing a couple of songs and get warmed up. Gone, 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 yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea, yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally, praise God, my sins, for G-O-N-E, gone. Gone, 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 yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea, yes, that's good enough for me. will do it this time. <laughs> roll away, roll away, roll away. Every burden of my heart, roll away. Roll away, roll away, roll away. Every burden of my heart, roll away. Every sin had to go. Except the Lord build the house. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Except the Lord build the house, they labor. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. They labor in vain that build them. One more action song.
last song, God can do anything but fail. God can do Brother Dave. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Get this set up. Get our slideshow ready to go this morning. There we go. Well, all right then. Well, I hope everyone is having a wonderful morning. I'm excited. We're getting closer and closer to Christmas, one of my most favorite times of the year. My most favorite times of the year. Well, you know what? Okay, so as I look out this morning, this is our Sunday school time. This is our story time. I'm not going to make you do it this Sunday, but let's keep it in mind for next Sunday. I know everyone has their preferred spot for like the main morning service, the spot where like God's going to speak to you and you got to stay there and that's really important. But for Sunday school, we're going to do things a little different next week. If maybe everyone could come just like a little closer, kind of like maybe no farther back than like where Miss Valerie is sitting and you guys can like put bulletins down or hymn books to save your original spots for like the next service. And so in that time in between, you can all reshuffle. But like, let's come a little closer because stories are no good unless you can kind of be inside of them and living with them. And you, it's hard to live in a story from the back row. And don't worry, this is where uh, Pastor wanted me to, to make sure that we talked more to the kids. So if your kids are acting up, that's okay. Don't worry about it. It's Sunday school, okay? All right. So this morning, we are going to do lesson number two about creation. Creation is such an important story that we're actually going to take two lessons to do it. And then after Christmas, we'll probably review again. Because it's the very first story. And often, like when you read a book or you read a story, the very first part, if you miss something, you're going to get all the way to the end and you're going to realize that something is missing and it doesn't make sense. So we got to make sure that we get the first part of the story right. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Like right there, that is the beginning of the story. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But before we get to all the wonderful things that happened today, we're going to talk about Day five, and day six, and day seven. That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we could get to all of the wonderful things that happen, I want to talk about the stories as a whole. See, the Bible, it's where we learn how to live rightly, right? You know, some people, we want to call the Bible like, you know, it's like your textbook where you learn how to live. It's like an instruction manual, you know, with like all the different pictures to tell us what to do. Or maybe and nowadays we would call it a YouTube tutorial where, you know, Moses is in here. It's like, well, here's how you walk in the righteous way and here's how you do your hair if you get your fringes and everything. It could be thought of as that way. But, but I want to tell you this morning, the Bible, it's so much more than all of that because the Bible is more than instruction manual. It's more than, than, than simply a text the Bible, think about it this way, the Bible is a place. The Bible is a place. And in this place, when we open the book, when we open the Bible, inside it, people live there. People live inside the Bible. This is where Abraham has a son when he's over 100 years old and his wife is almost as old. It was miraculous. This is where Moses takes the rod of God and it turns into a snake. And then after all the ten plagues, he parts the Red Sea and he leads the people of Israel out of bondage into the promised land. This is where David slays Goliath. It's where David comes from like a little shepherd boy and he becomes the king, becomes the greatest king 
that Israel would ever see. It's the place where Daniel would sleep with ferocious lions. It's the place where Jesus would be born in a manger, and it's the place where Jesus would die for our sins. And here's where it gets a little confusing, but you have to follow with me. So remember, the Bible is a place where the people in it come alive, and we can talk to them and learn from them. But remember, it's not just another place. It's not just like walking through a door, through a wardrobe, into a different world. That place where the Bible is, it's right here. It's right here in our hearts. And if we'll choose to live in that world, well, then we will live as God would have us to live. So this morning, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at day 5 and day 6. There we go. In verse 20, we're going to read a couple verses just about day five. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament, firmament, as we learned last week, that was the firmer mint, in the open firmament of the heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was what? God saw that it was what? I can't really hear you this morning. God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So this is the fifth day of creation. This is the day when God filled the waters and the sky. So on the earlier days, God had made the light, and then he had separated from the darkness, and then he made dry land. And now that there's all kind of like the bones of creation that God has made on day five, God is going to fill the depths of the sea and the tops of the sky with life. Because everywhere that God made things, he saw that it was beautiful and that it was good. And God wanted to fill it with life because that tells us something very important about life. And so, or about God himself. As we look, this is like a huge school of fishes. You see the little diver and how like tiny he looks? The seas are just amazing. They're just so full of life. And I don't know about you, maybe when you were a little kid you wanted to be a pirate or like a sailor, and go on the open seas or the high seas, as they say. And I don't know, I always thought that was really cool, but the one of the reasons why I think it's so cool is when you look down into the depths of the ocean, it's like there's all kinds of crazy life, and you can look out as far as you can see, and yet underneath the waves, there is life, and it's beautiful. The biggest fish that lives in the sea is the blue whale. Now, I I downloaded this picture because I wanted to show you just how big a blue whale is. So as you can see, we have our, our six-foot adult human average size and our blue whale average size, which is anywhere from 85 feet to 100 feet. Now, from where I'm standing here to the back of the auditorium, that's the smallest blue whale. That's about 85 feet. So if a full-size blue whale, his tail's about here, he's, he's like out on the front steps. Just think about that. And they weigh over 100 tons, up to 165 tons, which is like three semi-trailers. See, one, two, three, four, five, six elephants. How many of you guys have seen elephants at the zoo? You seen elephants at the zoo? They're pretty cool and they got the big trunky trunks. I like elephants. But don't make an elephant mad because they will slaughter you. But that's after the fall. Back in this time, elephants were wonderful creatures. Nobody killed anybody. They were not carnivores. There was no death. The world was beautiful. But just look at how big. This is the biggest animal in the world. And it swims all the way to the depths of the water. But who knows how do blue whales breathe? Anybody? Do blue whales have gills like fish? Blue whales breathe air just like humans. They're mammals. They're just like us except like a lot bigger and a lot different. But even though they swim all the way down in the bottoms of the water, they have to come up to the air. 
they surface to breathe. Isn't that crazy? And they can hold their breath for hours. The blue whale is the biggest of God's creation. And that, here's, here's, here's the funniest part to me. Blue whales, even though they're that big, bigger than like a, a, a massive plane, blue whales eat tiny little plankton or krill. They're little animals. They can't like swallow humans and tear them apart. Rather, when they open their big mouths, they close it and they have these special teeth and it, all the water drains out and the krill stays inside and then they just gulp it down. They eat about four tons a day. So they have a bit of a weight problem. <laughs> but blue whales are the largest of God's creation and they're starfish. I don't know how that's really alive, but it is and it floats and it can eat and even down at the bottoms of the ocean, the sun only gets to about 300 feet deep, and yet the bottoms of the ocean are about five miles deep. And scientists and humans, we thought that there was nothing that could live down there, because you think there's no sun, nothing can live. These guys live down there. This is an anglerfish, and this is a 3D model because I couldn't afford to buy an actual picture of it. But this is very, very close to how they live, and the female actually get about this big. And what they do is they have a little light at the end. Somehow they produce light at the very bottoms of the ocean. And they just kind of sit there with their mouths open. And other fish are like, ooh, shiny. And then they swim into their mouth, and they're eaten. I can tell you I am very theologically certain. Ah, oh, come on. Are we back? There we go. I'm theologically certain that this is a result of sin. I don't think these were around in the beginning. But they are now, and I hope you don't have too many nightmares, but a few would be nice. I would feel very satisfied. And, and, and there's all kinds of different fish, and we can eat them. And look at turtles. I mean, turtles, look at these guys. Like, on land, we call them turtles because they're really slow. But in the water, in their element, God made a place for all of his creatures. And on land, turtles are kind of funny. But in the water, these guys are majestic divers, and they can swim like nobody's business. And they got these shells, and they carry their house with them, and you can't hurt them. This is a picture of a coral reef. I've never been to see this. It's kind of on my bucket list to someday go to see a coral reef. I've seen, like, the documentaries. Well, in, the, in the tropical waters, it was warm, where it's warm, like, the whole world just comes to life and to color. And back in the Bible times, in the time of creation, from what we understand, there wasn't like the polar north and like the, the warm south. Rather, the whole world was warm and perfect. It was a paradise that God made. And if you look at these pictures, you see all these colors. Everything in this picture is alive. The little coral reefs, those are little organisms, and they filter in water, and they eat, and they live, and they move. And it's just incredible when you see this. I want you to see all the things that God made and how beautiful it is. Now, who doesn't like dolphins? Look at this, guys. It's a beautiful picture with the sunset. Dolphins can leap through the air like that. In fact, in Russia, they train them to play basketball, which is kind of cool. They can, like, you throw the ball out into the pool, they'll pick it up, and they can put it right through the hoop much better than me because I was homeschooled and they went to school and they travel in schools. But... <sighs> Dolphins are amazing. And just look at this. Look at his little smile. Didn't God make so many wonderful creatures? And then he not only did he fill all the way to the bottoms of the ocean with animals and with beautiful life, way up in the tops of the mountains, God wanted there to be birds, all to fill the skies and to fill the seas with animals and with life. This is a bald eagle. Just look at that majesty right there. That's America bald eagles. Amen. And they have, you know, parrots, which are filled with beautiful colors. And I mean, these guys, they'll actually talk to you. And so depending on who they're with, they'll say nice things or very nasty things. But I think it's cool that parrots can learn how to talk back to us. That's just, God is amazing. That's what we're getting at this morning. And these are albatross. Now, I wasn't quite certain whether there's, there's several different types of albatross. But an albatross is the largest bird that flies in the air, the wandering albatross. Their wingtips are over 12 feet. 12 feet. So that's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm still counting eight, nine, 10, 11, 
12. So over there to here, that's how big their winnings are. And they can fly over the seas for hundreds and hundreds of miles without stopping. And they're just majestic birds. Now on land, like the turtle, we call them goonies because they look so silly. They've got these big feet and they just kind of flap around. But in the air, that's where God made them to be and they fly for forever. And like a poem that was written, don't ever kill an albatross. It'll hang around your neck and it's just a very bad thing. And then there'll be water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. If you had to read that poem in school, you'll remember that. Otherwise, I'm just babbling, but that's okay. And not only did God fill the air with all different kinds of birds, he filled it with the, with the albatross, and then you have these massive birds all the way down to the tiniest little hummingbird, which weighs only a few ounces. And it can hover in the air and go backwards and forwards, and it's just amazing. And even down to pigeons and sparrows that live right out there on the street. So that was the end of the fifth day. So God says each, each time that he makes something, there was the beginning of the day and there was the end of the day. And that's kind of really important because God is telling us how he is making the world and how he wants it to be. There's going to be a beginning of the day and there's going to be an end of the day. So that every day is like a new world. It's a new creation. Maybe today you messed up. And maybe today you made your parents angry. And maybe today you're crying right now. But you know what? Tomorrow is a new world because the evening and the morning were a new day. And every morning, God's mercies are new. And he wanted to emphasize that in the very beginning, that this is the way he's going to make the world. He's going to fill it with life. And every day is going to be new. And so then we have one of my favorite days because that was the day that man was made, but also a lot of other cool creatures that I found some really cool pictures for you. Hopefully they'll display properly. On the sixth day, God made all the land animals. So on verse 23, the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Everyone looking with me, verse 24, please read it with me. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw, once again, that it was what? God saw that it was good. There's two things that God sees in this, in this section. When God makes something, he says, let this happen. And what happens when God says things? It was so. When God speaks, he speaks the world into order. His words are what orders everything around us. So God speaks, and it was so. And then God sees, and it's good. Because everything that God does is good and beautiful. Because that is who God is, and he can't do anything else. And so, on the sixth day, God makes the creatures of the land. We have elephants. Look at the little baby one. He's really cute. And these things are gentle giants. If you're nice to them, they'll be very nice. And you can actually train them to, in like India. They like sit on top of them and they can ride them. Hannibal tried to use them in war and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But if you make them mad, they'll go really crazy. They can flip cars and hurt people. And he made the ugly hippopotamus, which is like tons and tons of blubber. And he's pretty massive. And then he made lions. Look at all that majesty right there. This is the king of beasts, as he's been called. And as you look at that picture, I think you can see why. I think every king that ever lived wished that he looked like that. And if I was a king, that's what I would aspire to. But I'm not, so there you are. And he made jaguars, which are like another type of leopard, and they live in trees, and they're just as big as lions. So don't mess with jaguars. They're also terrifying. He made lions, and he made tigers, and he made bears. Oh my, you got the idea. This is a grizzly bear, and they can swim, and they go out into the water, and they, they, uh, they eat salmon, which run upstream, and the bears go into the stream, and they catch them and eat them. So if you're fishing for salmon, beware of grizzly bears, because they are also very terrifying. But after the fall. So we've got to remember, 
we see all these creatures and we think of them as they are now, as carnivorous, ferocious, large mouth, devouring. But when God originally made this, there was no sin, there was no death. So if there wasn't any death, well, they couldn't have been eating each other, right? Rather, it seems, from what we understand, that they were all just eating plants. They were herbivores, as they call them. They eat plants. But it was a beautiful world that God made, and it was full of life. And, and this is the polar bear. I think he just wants a treat. He's begging. Pretty please. And then moose, they live out by themselves. I've always wanted to hunt moose, because I've heard they're really good, and they're very terrifying. But maybe someday. It's another one of my bucket lists. And then they made horses. This is a picture I found. It's from Romania, actually, as Miss Mariana would know. See, it's beautiful. The horses are incredible. And we, as humans, we've learned to train them and to ride them and to take them to, 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 back in the day, you know, before tractors, to run the crops. And even now, we still use them to race horses. They're majestic animals. They're something that when you look at them, yes, they're stinky and smelly in Central Park and they smell things up. But in... In general, they're beautiful animals that God made. You know, cows to live in the valleys and to eat the, the, uh, the grass and to make wonderful milk for cereal and Fruit Loops. And then way up on the top of the mountains, way up on the top of the mountains, you have these mountain goats. And I don't know if you've seen videos of them, but how they can climb like straight up the rock face of a wall. They've got these little hooves that they split in the middle and they're basically like little vice grips. So even like, you know, I've done a little bit of rock climbing where, you know, you got to put chalk on your hands and you got to find just the right grip and it's too far and then you fall and hit the mat or hopefully you're wearing a harness or not, then you're going to get medevaced out of there and hopefully only in traction for a couple of months and not buried. But as humans, we're not super good at climbing these types of mountains. But God made these little goats and they can climb amazingly. They're on these edges where you think, wouldn't that little guy be terrified that he's going to fall? And they don't. And they've got these special hooves that they can climb right up the side of a mountain. And what we learn from this, what I'm trying to get at, is that everywhere that God made, he made it, and it was good. And everywhere that God made, he wanted there to be life. Now it says that every kind came after his kind. So they're all different, and they're all unique. But we're not talking about evolution. That doesn't happen. That's not the way that God made it. We're not talking about, well, we started out with a little amoeba, and he's in like a little pool of stuff stuff. And eventually that becomes, I don't know, a monkey. And then after the monkey, eventually you end up with me. And I know from my behavior this morning, maybe that would make a little bit of sense. But every kind after his kind. That's how God made it. That's how God, it still is today. But we have all these different kinds of animals because everywhere that God made, he saw that it was good and he wanted there to be life and he wanted it all to be different because he loves things to be different. And if you look out across this room right now, I think you'll understand what I'm talking about because none of us are like me and I am not like any of you. And that is the same for each one of you, even for all these four little Brinkman girls. Same mommy, same daddy, they all grew up in the same house. But this one over here is a lot different from that one over here. And just like the turtle doesn't do very well on land, but it does great in the deep sea, God made different people for different places because he wanted there to be life and he loves things to be different. And then in verse 26, if you'd look with me, and God said, let us make man in our own image. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish, and of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And at the end of all the works that God did, after all he made the land and he made the light and he made the darkness and he separated it and he made all the fishes of the sea and all the birds of the air, God made man. And it was the greatest thing that he ever made. 
And man, many people, they want to talk about how, well, man, our men are sinful. And it's like, you know, the classic story. It's like, okay, so there's two people drowning in the same lake. You've got a human and you've got a dog. Which do you save? Well, I worked with a lot of coworkers, and they said, I would save the dog because the dog didn't do anything wrong. And the human is evil, and therefore they should drown. And that is that's so messed up and so horrible because, yes, dogs are innocent, but human life is so much more valuable. And why are they valuable? Because they were made in the likeness of God. In each, every one of us, there is the image of God. God made us to be image bearers of himself. Think about that for a minute. God made us in his likeness, and that's what makes us valuable, not because we have some sort of group of people that we're connected to, not because I am a tall white person, not because I'm a short brown person, not because I'm a scientist, which I'm not, not because I'm a carpenter, which I am. Those things don't make me valuable. What makes me valuable is that I am made in God's image. I can think, I can reason. I am different than the animals. In Psalm 8, verse 3, it says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful him of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Think about that for a minute. We're almost done. Why did God make humans? Look at this picture. You look out and you can see the stars. You can't really do this here, but whenever you're out in the middle of nowhere and you turn off all the lights and you look up into the sky, I can remember a time when I was at my grandmother's house in Pennsylvania and we were staying in the van and it was very, 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 very cold. We almost froze to death. Not really, but it felt like that. And we turned off all the lights and we looked up into the sky and the more that we looked, the more stars that we could see. And you saw just like we've been talking about, that everywhere that God made something, even though this world is now broken and sinful, and we're going to talk about that after Christmas, even though this world is broken and there's all these problems, you still see that the world that God made is good. And it tells us about God himself. But you think about it, in light of this big, beautiful world that God made, why did God make us? Why is God mindful of us when you look at all the beautiful things that God made? And, and I can't answer all of those questions, but I do know that God loves us and that God actually he made this world for himself. He made it beautiful because that's what he does. And then he made man. And this is the cool part. He elevated us to be a little lower than the angels. In fact, what he says is that, you know, some people have different perspectives. You know, you talk about how the world is made and, and how humans interact. Well, humans are a cancer on the world. And if we just get rid of all the humans, well, then the world would be beautiful. Well, that's not how God made it to be. And neither on the other side did God make us to destroy the world and to make machines that cut down forests in a day. That's not exactly what God intended. God made us to enjoy the world with him. It's an amazing privilege that we have. And God said... Behold, verse 29, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree, a tree, I'm sorry, yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I've given every green herb for meat and it was so. And God made, saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Verse 1 of chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had made. So in six days God made the world, and then he rested. To give us a picture of how we ought to rest. Work six days and rest on one. And that's a whole other story we can get into. You can ask Pastor exactly how that works, but now... You know, eventually that will become to the Sabbath, and, and, and that will be part of the Jewish people. And nowadays we rest in Christ. That's how we partake in the Sabbath. We rest in Christ. But God saw everything that he had made, and he saw that it was good. And he made mankind, and he put them in the garden. 
And afterwards, we'll learn more about how that all happened and how the beautiful world that God made would become something very, very different. But for right now, let's just think about the beautiful world that God made and how he made life everywhere. And all the beauty that we see, it doesn't come from some strange processes. It doesn't come from anything but God. All the beauty that we see it comes from God itself. And here's, here's the moral of the story as we end. Here's the moral of the story. All that God made was beautiful and good because that's who he is. In every story, there's a main character. In every story, there's a main character. And we learn something about that main character. Well, as we go through the stories, here's something I want you to keep in mind. The main character of the Bible is God. The main character of the Bible is God. And as we talk about different people that come in to the story and exit the story, the people that live in the Bible, each of them, they teach us something about ourselves and something about God. And in this story, we see that God made all that there is. All comes from him. And it's beautiful, and it was good, because that's who he is. And then we know that God created the world for himself, but that he has chosen to share it with us. And he's given us dominion over the world, unlike any other beast that he's created. Because he made us special, and we should be thankful for that. And we should never dishonor our bodies or other humans, because there's something special that God made. And it's very different than anything else, and that's where the value comes from. All right, so let's pray this morning as we head into the main service. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. I'm so thankful that you made us and the beautiful world that you made. We love that you are beautiful and that you are good. Help us to be thankful for that, to learn how to behave in your world that you've given us. Amen. All right, we've got just a few minutes before the morning service begins, so...
right, good morning, everybody. Go ahead and join me standing. Join me in standing as we're into December now, singing those great Christmas hymns. Turn your hymnal to number 87. Number 87 in your hymnals, Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels We Have Heard on High as we'll sing all four verses. Number 87 in your hymnals on that verse of Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply. continue singing 105 go tell it on the mountain we'll sing all three verses as it starts off on that chorus 105 in your hymnals go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ
please remain standing for the prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this beautiful Sunday morning. We're thankful for each one that is here as we assemble together in the name of our Savior. Lord, we need you to superintend each part of the service, every song sung, Lord, the special music, the, uh, the preaching, the invitation, the offering. Lord, every part of this service, we ask that you would encourage us and strengthen us in our service for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing. Open to number 83 in your hymnals. Number 83, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Number 83, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, as we sing all four verses there on that first. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It says, and in despair, even when things around us are going bad, they said, oh, man, in, in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep on that fourth verse. No, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. Listen to those words as we sing them out. 103, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. There i 
It's good to have Ruthie and Philip back, and she's going to play a song for us on the flute this morning. Take your Bibles, if you would. I think you need to turn this mic down just a little bit there, if you would. And uh, Luke chapter 1. And so we have been the last uh, couple Sunday mornings. We talked about the spirit of Christmas and 
last Sunday preached on the follow of Christmas, how that Jesus came and his message is still to us today to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And today I would like to preach on the fear of Christmas. If you remember the Christmas story, if you're familiar with it at all, uh, you'll remember that the first thing the angel said as they appeared to different people was, fear not. And so we're going to just look at those different times and hopefully find application. I believe we can find more than ample application to our lives today. And uh, just want to uh, give you a little uh foreshadow next week. Can you believe it? Next Sunday is Christmas Sunday. Uh, and by the way, thank you for all that prayed for safety. Uh, you remember, uh, most of you have heard about those tornadoes. We were driving right through that area. We were 10 miles from the warehouse that blew down in uh, Evansville, Indiana. Uh, that was like nine o'clock. I think we were going through there about 8.30. And uh, sirens were blaring and all kinds of different things. And the Lord protected us. You never know what you're praying for when you pray. Amen. And so uh, we, we're just thankful to uh, be here and be safe. And uh, uh, just to uh, uh, have this opportunity to go together through the scriptures. But fear is a great part of our lives. In fact, if you study psychology, something which I don't recommend, uh, a psychologist built an entire understanding of human behavior based on fear. Everything is connected to fear. We read our Bible, <clears throat> and there's a cure for fear. It's love. Love is the cure for fear. It says, perfect love casteth out fear, 1 John 4, 19. So I'll give you a heads up, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, going to preach on the love of the Christmas story. But if we're going to really understand the love of the Christmas story, we've got to get rid of the fear first. Amen. And so here in, first, in Luke chapter 1, and of course, the Christmas story in its entirety starts many months before. Uh, it was uh, just a, a highlight of our trip to Oklahoma. Uh, the uh, message in the chapel was well received. We had 46 students at the information meeting for the inner city missions class. Uh, that is more students than we've ever had express interest in the class. And so I uh, do want you to keep all of those things uh, in prayer, and uh, it was uh, a good time, but got to see the twins, David and Isabel. And uh, I'll tell you, so, so teeny. I mean, it felt like the whole baby was fitting in the palm of my hand. Uh, part, of his, uh, part of him was hanging down my arm just a little bit, but I, I think back to our last one. Uh, we could take both of them, add them together, and we still didn't get one Jason. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, they're, they're doing well, and, uh, and uh, I'll update you on Grandma. Please keep her in prayer. She is not in ICU, praise the Lord. Went into the hospital Tuesday night, uh, but still on uh, isolation on special treatments and things like that, holding her own. She's not slipping back, and so keep, keep praying for uh, uh, Lee Marshall, that uh, God would intervene. Dad is seemingly on the mend, uh, moving out from under some of the worst symptoms there. Didn't have to go to the hospital, but still dealing with the COVID. And so let's, let's keep all of those things in prayer. And when we talk about fear, uh, those are things we're afraid of today. And, and rightly so. But back to our story, babies are born in a moment in time. Amen? Uh, but there's quite a process that goes on before that. And so six months before uh, Mary was announced that her baby was going to be born, we have the announcement to Zecharias the priest 
that John was going to be born. And in Luke chapter 1, as we look at the story here in uh, verse uh, 10, it says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now, as I was praying about this and thinking about this, I, how many of you have ever been afraid when God actually answered your prayers? I mean, stop and think about Zechariah and Elizabeth. They had spent their whole life in prayer for a son. Why was that so important? Because Zechariah's family history goes all the way back to the family of Aaron the priest at the foot of Mount Sinai. He knew every generation, he might not be able to recite it right off the top of his head, but it was all written down, documented, had to be, or he couldn't be a priest. If he had no son, then that part of the family would disappear from the pages of history. Only the direct descendants of Aaron and his sons could minister as priest in the temple they tell us that once, possibly twice in his entire life of service as a priest, would he have the privilege to offer the incense on the altar in the temple. If you've been around our church long, you know that that incense is, though it was actual uh, incense that was actually burned on a real golden altar before the uh, uh, the veil that separated the holy from the most holy places in the temple. And that was carried on every day and every evening from the time that the temple had been rebuilt with Zerubbabel and the return from the captivity. This was Zechariah's time to do that. The only light in the temple was the golden candlesticks. And all of a sudden, a man appears in the air, standing on the right side of the altar. How many of you think that would scare you pretty good? Uh, I, I think I'd, I'd have a little bit of reason to be a little nervous about that. How about you? And that's without TV and special effects and computer-generated computer graphics and uh, all of the things that we are so familiar with today, uh, this would have been an amazing phenomenon to behold. And the angel tells him, fear not, your prayers are answered. But I'd like you to understand something here. God took his prerogative to answer Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayers his way, not Zechariah's way. Zechariah wanted a son to follow him in the priesthood as he and his uh, fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers all the way back in history for well over 1,500 years at this point had been obedient to these commands when God was all completely done, Zechariah's name and his family would still disappear from the pages of history. But how many are you familiar with John the Presbyt I mean John the Baptist? I just have to do that every once in a while. Forgive me. John the Baptist. How many are familiar with the story of John the Baptist? I mean, everybody knows about part of our name as a Baptist church is connected to Zechariah's son. You know, when God answers our prayers his way, 
Little sarcasm here. He usually does a little bit better job than would have happened if he had answered his our prayers our way. Would you say amen with me to that? You see, God wants us to pray. That's one of the main themes of the scriptures. And we have a promise in 1 John that if we pray according to his will, he will hear and he will answer our prayers. Amen? But how many of you have had God answer a prayer a little differently than you had hoped? And how many of you are spiritually wise enough to know that God did a better job answering your prayer than you did praying your prayer? Could we say amen to that? And so as we look at the story here today, real events, real lives, a real application, don't be afraid of God answering prayer. Let God be God. Could we say amen to that? You see, let's go down to the latter part of the chapter here. And it's really kind of funny as the story goes on. Zechariah uh, uh, in verse 18 says, Whereby shall I know this? Uh, wait a minute. The angel of God appeared beside the altar of incense in the temple in Jerusalem and told you what is going to happen. And he's saying, How do I know that this is true? Uh, Zechariah was not what we would call a, a great man of faith. And God said, I'm going to build that faith into you. I'm going to give you the next nine months of total silence to think about this. And every time you would open your mouth and say something, you're going to be reminded of the fact that you didn't believe God the way that God wanted you to believe in him. Amen? And so we get down here to verse uh, 65. And uh, it is the day the child has been born. They're naming the child. All the neighborhood is there. They're rejoicing with Elizabeth. And uh, she says, no, the child's name is John. And they say, wait a minute, nobody in your family's named John. And so they bring a writing tablet to Zechariah, uh, as he has been pretty much ignored to this point through the whole situation. And he wrote on there, his name is John. I think all you'd have to do is put a knee, John. Oh, actually, would be who, John, in Hebrew. He is John. And uh, guess what? All of a sudden, Zechariah could speak. And guess what happened? Look what it says here. And immediately his tongue was loosed, and he spake, and praised God, and fear came on all that dwelt around them, and all these things were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. Can somebody else, maybe even one of our younger people here, tell me a name of a town in the hill country of Judea that plays a very important part in the Christmas story? Yeah, you got it. Bethlehem. Now, Let's look at the time period here. This is six months before Jesus is born. The entire hill country all around Bethlehem, south of Jerusalem there, is buzzing with the noise of the birth, the miraculous birth to Zechariah the priest of a son that is named John. Things that troubles me somewhat as we contemplate this fear in having your prayers answered. Uh, I think about all the prayers, answers to prayer. One of them you're sitting in this morning, this building, and 
everything that's in it. We prayed about the building. We prayed about the carpet. We prayed about the ceiling, uh, the walls. We prayed about all the work. We prayed about the electrical and the gas pipes that you can't see. We prayed about everything in this building. How many remember those prayers? And I've been with some other preachers and they mean well by this, but they really don't understand. Oh, you're just lucky. Uh, no, we're not lucky. We've received answers to our prayers. Ooh, that's, that's kind of scary, isn't it? Well, sometimes it's scary praying. But why should we be afraid when God answers our prayers? We are. How many of you have ever been shocked when God answered your prayer? Oh, <gasps> wow. Can I challenge you that that borders on insulting God? Is not God a prayer answering God? I mean, Zechariah set the perfect example for us. Here's the answer to his prayer announced by an angel in the temple of God. And he goes, are you sure about this? Uh, would you mind proving to me that this is actually going to happen, that I'm not dreaming this? And I would like to challenge you today as we think of the Christmas story. We're still supposed to live for the Lord Jesus Christ till he comes. And part of that relationship with God is our prayer life. And we need to learn to pray without fear. And when God chooses to answer our prayers differently than we would like, we need to learn to pray in submission to His will and His knowledge and His authority as God. Can we say amen to that? That's the first fear not. The second one's also in Luke chapter 1. Let's skip down to verse 30 here. And this is the famous story of Mary. The angel appears, comes into Mary, and uh, the angel's first words in verse 30 to her is, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, I'd like you to look at this and think about this story. The first words the angel says to her is, fear, not first words, but the angel gives her a greeting and then says to her, Fear not. I would like you to think about all that transpired here and all that went on as we contemplate these prophecies that go back nearly 4,000 years to the time that Adam and Eve stood without the garden as God was judging them for their sin, he gave a promise that the seed of the woman, which has no seed, would bruise the serpent's head, that God would send salvation to the people and uh, send, uh, to mankind. And Eve, when Cain was born, her firstborn said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. This is God's Savior. That didn't work out too well, did it? Now here is Mary, impoverished, living under Roman domination and after all these millennia, God was going to use her to fulfill 
the Old Testament prophecies. I'll tell you, the angel rightly said, don't be afraid. And Mary's response was a response of faith. Uh, she says down here in verse 36, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Mary submitted to the direction of God. And it's interesting, the angel gives her a sentence or two. And then when she asks how these things are going to be, he gives her another sentence or two. But there is verse after verse after verse talking about who is going to be born. You see, you have to understand something. When God fulfills prophecy, you and I aren't the important ones in the scheme of things. God is. Can we say amen to that? Now, I'd like to challenge you. These nearly 2,000 years after the birth of Christ, according to some people's calendars, a little over 2,000 years. We've got a lot of prophecy that's getting ready to fulfill. Amen? And if I really want to get things quiet in here, all I got to start doing is preaching about the tribulation and the prophecy of the Lord's coming and, and, and everybody starts getting a little scared and a little nervous. Isn't that true? You want to know how Antichrist is going to take over the world and control every living human being in the world? Hey, they're setting up the paradigm right now. No, the mark of the beast is not in the vaccine, all right? That's, <laughs> come on. But let me tell you, the mechanics and the machine that's going to make that happen is being rolled out and tested uh, right now. I'm not a conspiratorialist. Uh, oh, no. I would like you to take a lead from Mary here and embrace what God is going to do and stop being afraid that God's prophecies are going to be fulfilled. Could we say amen to that? Do you realize that the kingdom of our Lord and Jesus our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, could begin just a little over seven years from today. Can you imagine what this earth is going to be like with Jesus in charge of everything? No politicians. What a world it will be. All years are gone. Truth will reign supreme, for truth will be on the throne of David, ruling this world from the, the city of David, the fulfillment of these prophecies that were given to Mary right here are actually yet to be realized. And the moment I start talking about what these things are going to happen in the future, everybody gets afraid, and it's time to stop being afraid of God fulfilling His prophecy it's time to surrender to the Word of God. Could we say amen to that? It's time to be encouraged. It's time to realize that some terrible things are going to have to happen to things uh, that we love. Uh, we can't find America in the prophetic uh, 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 scope uh, of, uh, of what we understand from the book of Revelation. Hey, I don't want to be on the wrong side of prophecy. How about you? I want to be on God's side. He was there before we are. And we need to love him and obey him and keep serving him until he takes us home to be with him in heaven. Mary, unlike Zacharias, gave us the perfect 
example of how not to be afraid of God's promise to fulfill prophecy. Can we say amen? Zechariah gave us a negative example of how we shouldn't behave when God answers prayer. But let's look at the next one here. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And of course, this is the story of Joseph. And I, I like to spend some time every year talking about the faith of Joseph. You stop and you think of what Joseph went through. And most people's relaying of the Christmas story in these events, Joseph is almost non-topical. In fact, some religious uh, groups paint Joseph as an uh, oxygenarian um, in a wheelchair with a life support system strapped in, and he married Mary just to give her a name. And let me tell you, none of that's true. Joseph and Mary were going through the normal process of espousal, engagement, marriage. And we've gone through this time and time again, and just one more time to repeat it. The Jewish wedding was not about the bride. The Jewish wedding was about the groom. Every hope and plan and part of Jacob, uh, Joseph's life here was connected to this marriage, his place in society, his activity at the synagogue, his ability to speak up in the community councils and be recognized as a, uh, a part of, of, of the community there at Nazareth was all contingent upon his wedding. It would be an occasion, even though Nazareth was uh, not a large city like Jerusalem. It was still one of the towns. Everybody in town would have known and understood, and many would have participated in, in the festivities, of which there were none. Mary had gone to visit Elizabeth, and just about the time that John the Baptist was born, Mary heads back to Nazareth, and the promises that God had made to her through the angel three months before could not be hidden. People began talking. People began trying to figure out what was going on. Of course, you know how people think about things. It's not positive. If, if you're not careful, you will think the worst about everything. That's human nature now, isn't it? And I want to challenge you. There is no trick the devil likes to pull more than the one he was pulling on Joseph or thought he was pulling on Joseph right here. He was making God's will look bad. Wasn't he? Joseph had already promised they were in an engagement. It would, they weren't married physically yet. That wouldn't happen until Joseph went over to Mary's house and announced to the entire town uh, that they were consummating the marriage. That's when the, the marriage supper would follow. Uh, it would often last several days depending on the social standing of the groom. And... God appears to Joseph in a dream and he says, don't be afraid to follow through on the commitments that you've already made. Don't be afraid to be obedient to God's direction in your life. The devil loves to make obedience to God look ridiculous. Look sinful. 
I mean, you just listen, sensitize your ears to what's going on around us and listen to the news broadcast and you will hear on a regular basis wicked, God-hating people talking about righteousness from the Bible as if it were evil. You will hear that regularly. You know what a lot of Christians do? They get afraid of being obedient to God because of what unsaved, godless people who are on their way to hell think about them. It's time to stop being afraid of being obedient to God. Can we say amen? It's time for us to take a lesson from Joseph here in this Christmas story who got up that night and wandered across, not wandered, walked across the city of Nazareth to Mary's house and knocked on the door and said, I am here to take Mary as my wife. Now, I would like you just to think really and, and honestly about what was going on because in Mary's household, how was Mary going to explain that an angel appeared to her and said she was going to have a son? Would you believe her? Do you think her parents believed her? Do you think anybody believed her? She didn't even dare mention those words. That had, uh, historians tell us that uh, that had often been lied and used as an excuse for to try and cover the immorality uh, that was found out in a young woman's life. Mary had no choice but to thank God that he had chosen her and trust God to work out all the details. Amen? But could you imagine Mary's parents and the relief? Oh, Joseph, everything's going to be okay. But later on when Jesus was a man, do you remember what the Pharisees accused him of? He said, we be not born of fornication. They had the calendars. They knew what was going on. But God in his infinite wisdom had intervened and taken a pure, engaged young woman and kept that marriage sacrosanct and biblical all within God's line of authority. The only difference was God himself was being born through the agent of Mary. And in order for that to be a, totally according to the law, Joseph had to do what he was told. God picked Joseph because he knew he would be obedient. Even though others would criticize him and others would accuse him and others would think less of him. You know what? God's will does not always make sense. How many of you have had family members say, are you crazy for going to church? You, do you really think that's the best thing you can do with your life? I've had family members, especially when I was just a young kid getting ready to go to Bible college, say, hey, what, what are you doing wasting your life being a preacher? I'll tell you what, they're not saying that anymore. Because I got better stories than they do. I got greater things than they could ever dream of happening. Because when you obey God, he does things right. You cannot improve on obedience to God and his word. That's why I hope you're in church today. I hope that is the main reason you are here is to be obedient to God. You see, the devil 
wants to make doing right look wrong. He's good at it. He's been doing it all the way through human history since the Garden of Eden. He made eating that fruit look so good to Eve that she obeyed the devil and disobeyed God. Now, we've got some things that we need to learn. Number one, don't be afraid when God answers your prayers His way. Amen? Do and God wants to use you to serve Him in some way. He did with Mary. Amen? A unique person in all of history. And it wasn't all pleasant for Mary. We read in the Bible that she pondered these things in her heart. That's got a kind of melancholy ring to it now, doesn't it? You know what? She didn't understand everything that had happened to her. She didn't understand everything. And she never would, by the way, no human being ever has understood. It's not our job to understand. It's our job to believe. But Mary got it right. Be it unto me according to thy word. How many stories could I tell of people who've made shipwreck of their lives and of their children because they weren't willing, they were afraid to echo the words of Mary and say, I'm a servant of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. It's time to stop being afraid of that and embrace what God has for us and to just simply obey God. Tell you what, I haven't always understood what the Lord was trying to do, but I'll tell you this, He's brought us through every step Every trial. He's brought us across every precipice where we had no idea what was in front of us. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We got one more. Luke chapter 2. If you haven't memorized these verses, most of us do as children. Or sometime around Christmas when all the kids get up and recite parts of the Christmas story, you're going to learn these verses. It says in verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. How many of you are afraid of getting saved? before you got saved? How many are afraid of getting baptized? How many of you have been afraid of being a faithful member of the church? How many have been afraid of letting God's salvation work in your life? God didn't save you just so you can say that you're saved. He saved you for each and every day for the rest of of all eternity. These shepherds had good reason to be afraid. The glory of the Lord is one of the most fearful things that you will ever find in the Bible. You go through the Old Testament and read the cases where God's glory appeared. There were usually some really bad things attached to that. I mean, remember the story of Dathan and Abiram? I mean, God's glory appeared, but that was a fearful and devastating thing. 
The Bible describes our God in the book of Hebrews as a consuming fire. No human has ever looked on the face and presence of God and lived. Moses got to see his hinder portions, amen. Someone said, well, how, how did anybody look at Jesus if he was God? Well, unlike the theologian, Mr. Wesley, who wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Sing, Jesus did not lay his glory by. He did not stop being God. You know what he did? He veiled it so that we could look at him as a man. He just covered it. He opened that just a little crack a couple of times, the Mount of Transfiguration, when he was transfigured and he was glistening whiter than the sun and talked with Moses and Elijah about his coming crucifixion. As he was arrested in the garden, they, he asked them, Whom seek ye? And he just uttered the one Hebrew word, I am. And they all fell on their faces in front of him. There were a few times Jesus let us see just a little bit. But when we get to heaven, we're going to know him as he knows us. Think about that. You know, there are people who are afraid of getting saved because they're afraid of what God will do with their lives. I want to challenge you. He'll do a better job than you can. Can we say amen to that, those of you that are saved today? That's encouraging. Do you really believe that? People are afraid. I've, I've known parents. God might want my kid to go to the mission field. Well, I'll tell you, those brand new twins. They just started their uh, internship at Southwest. And they were going to be about a year or so at Southwest. They're, uh, they're already making plans to be here uh, a year from now on deputation uh, and going to the South Sudan. You want to talk about a scary place? Five little grandbabies going to South Sudan. That, that is terrifying. But I want to tell you something. In my heart, I'm a thousand percent behind them because that's where God has called them to be. I want my children and my grandchildren to be obedient to the words of this book because I'm not afraid of the salvation that God gives me. I had a preacher grab me up by my uh, jacket that wasn't wearing a suit. He grabbed, and literally grabbed me by, the, by my coat, my jacket, and said, they're going to eat you in New York City. And I'm sitting there going. At, at that time, I was, I was really taken back. I mean... Uh, I was a young man in my 20s, and uh, the only thing I knew to do was say, I, I'm, I'm going where God called me. And there's a lot of things that happen, but nobody's tried to eat me. Amen? How silly we are when we express fear toward God in letting him have his will and his way in our hearts and lives. How could you be more foolish, my friend? I know people who are on their way to hell today because they're afraid to get saved. I could give you story after story till next Sunday morning of names and people who have destroyed their lives and the lives of their children because they were afraid to let God's salvation work in their life and in their family. I want you to understand something. There's a lot of fear in this Christmas story and in the things that happened here. 
And that fear is the natural result of our human carnal nature. But if you read this story, God overcame that at every instance. And God was glorified in it. Can we say amen to that? It is time for us as servants of God to stop being afraid that God might answer our prayers. It's time for us to stop being afraid that God might want to use me in his service. It's time for us to stop being afraid to be obedient to God because of the criticisms of the world and the way things look you obey God, you will never go wrong. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that life more abundantly. I've tasted a little of that abundant life and I'll tell you what, there is nothing this world offers that even comes close to a drop of that abundant life that Jesus gives. He first saves you. You know, one of the greatest gifts that God gives us is He will get you past yourself if you will surrender to Him. One of the biggest problems today, people take themselves too seriously. I mean, look at the way people drive. I get to go first. I don't care who else is on the road. I'm going to, I remember this was several years ago. It's down here uh, on the Grand Central right there as you get on at Astoria Boulevard. And I'm looking through the rearview mirror and here comes a Chrysler 300 straight through all the curves. Just driving like this. Not pay, I mean, cars are getting out of the way. I mean, that driver could have caused 10 wrecks in 10 seconds. You know, people just think too much about themselves. And if you ever have a question about that, just go get a splinter and you'll find out how important you are. Isn't that true? But you think of how God wrecked Zechariah's hopes and plans in future and erased his heritage off of the list of the priest, but he gave him John the Baptist a testimony for all eternity, the forerunner of the Messiah. Mary and Joseph's lives, their wedding, uh, so many things after that would all be connected to the birth of this one, Jesus Christ. They just surrendered to God's will. And the same is true for all of us who will. Fear not. It said, for unto you is born this day a Savior. Do you know what that means? If there is a Savior born in Bethlehem, then the temple that they worshipped at couldn't save them. Do you get that? I believe these were the temple shepherds raising the sacrificial flocks. Every part of their life and their tradition was preparing these animals to be sacrificed on the altar, and if a Savior was born in Bethlehem, that means they were out of a job. If you're going to get saved, you've got to turn loose of your life, your plans, your wishes. But I'll tell you what, you'll never do better than simply being obedient to Christ. You see, you want to get rid of the fear in your life? You got to get love. Next Sunday sermon, let's pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to evaluate our own lives and hearts honestly and truly. And Lord, that we would look at what we are having a problem with, being obedient to the Lord and surrendering to him. Lord, I could go through a list of all these things, but I pray that the Holy Spirit would do that in the individual lives. That each one of us here would give freedom, that we would invite the Holy Spirit to convict us of that which needs changing in our own hearts. And more important than just being convicted, we'd be willing to get out of our seat, and get on our knees in a public altar and say, I need to stop being afraid. I need to stop hindering the work of God in my life. Lord, we desperately need your blessings upon our lives and upon our church. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray that you would work in each heart and life here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's have Leland come lead us in the hymn of invitation. As he is leading us, if you need to come and pray, now is the time. that God has been able to do the work he wanted to do in your heart and life. You may be seated. If we could have our men come at this point, we'd receive this morning's offering. Let us give in worship to our Lord and Savior. George, would you ask God to bless the offering? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, 
for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you bless us with a sunny morning. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the privilege to gather together and worship you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your message reminding us that 2,000 years ago, Lord, you sent your only son uh, to fulfill the promise that you've given us, a Savior who through him, through his blood and uh, resurrection, he has given us eternal life. We thank you, Lord, all for all the blessing you've given us throughout the years and days, and including the permission to partake in this offering. May you accept this return that we give back to you and honor it, Lord. We continue to pray, Lord, that you will just continue to keep us safe, Lord, and especially from this uh, pandemic virus. Lord. Keep us safe and keep us uh, 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 guide us, Lord. Give us the wisdom to always walk a path that you have set before us. This I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And just a few announcements. I'm sure most of you have heard uh, Mrs. Marshall, Lee Marshall, went into the hospital Tuesday night with uh, COVID. Uh, she is not in ICU. She's in uh, what they call a uh, medical surge unit. It's two steps down. Uh, she has not gotten any worse since she got into the hospital. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, she is still fighting and literally, you know, fighting for her life. I want you to pray for her. If you would, keep her in your prayers. Uh, but the nurses have been uh, very positive about how she is and doing there. Pray for Julia. If, she, if you would, she stayed behind in Oklahoma City. She's going to be flying back in, Lord willing, tomorrow afternoon and evening. And uh, also uh, at Union, uh, some of you remember uh, Yuval, he was the owner of the building that was right next to Union. He's already gotten us an expediter and we're meeting with the engineer and we've got contact with a plumber. Uh, it looks like we're going to be able to get the heat uh, put in upstairs at Union, so I want you to pray about that, if you would. And while I was in Oklahoma City, I was talking to Brother Copes, and he has a, knows a Christian foundation. He said, I'm going to talk to these people. We're going to pay for at least one of those permits. And so that's another $2,000 right there. And so I want you to keep this in prayer. Lord is working. And our Christmas Eve service is coming up. Um, we got a lot of work to do. We got the scaffolding up. Now we got to put the lights up paint the ceiling, seal everything up, finish it all, and take scaffolding down and still clean the building before Christmas Eve. And uh, it can happen, uh, so I want you to pray about that. If you would, I would love to have that second Christmas Eve service upstairs uh, instead of downstairs over at Union, so keep all of these things uh, in prayer if you would. All right, uh, regular services, and just remember... Uh, next, not this this week, but the following week, uh, a week from today is Christmas Sunday. Uh, we will have our regular Thursday evening service here, but we'll also have the Christmas Eve service at Union. And uh, we would just really encourage you, if at all possible, to come over there and just be a part of, of that service. We're working on the governor's new mass mandates, trying to figure out how in the world we're supposed to deal with something that nobody knows what they said. And so just uh, pray about that, and uh, we'll try to figure that thing out. So come and lead us as we are dismissed. Join me in standing. It's 51 in your hymnals if you need the words. Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth. And joy of heaven. We are dismissed.